Hi. Uh, oh, thanks for uh, joining us today. My name is Ahmed, and uh, I am um, originally Palestinian. I live in New York. I currently work for Vice on HBO. How many people have heard of Vice on HBO? Fantastic. How many people have watched Vice on HBO? You're all lying. Um, the truth is, uh, in two minutes, I think it's really hard to explain kind of what I've done in the business beyond uh, just mentioning I've hoped to always try and find ways to disrupt kind of the current method of storytelling. I think that's why we're all here. We're very excited to hear from different people about where the industry's headed, what people are doing right, and obviously everyone's trying to target the coveted uh, millennial uh, demographic, and I've been fortunate enough to work for companies which have allowed us to do that. I used to work for Al Jazeera English. I had a show called The Stream, uh, and then I worked for something called HuffPost Live. How many people have heard of HuffPost Live? Fantastic. Okay, so people here you, watch things sorry, on the internet. Can you tell me what Vice HBO is? Because I've never seen it. So Vice on HBO is a program that uh, is a documentary program that's uh, maybe a 15-minute show. Uh, it only airs on HBO Go and HBO Now, which I've learned sadly, as my parents have told me repeatedly, uh, is very hard to access anywhere outside of the U.S., which is, I see people nodding, which is sad. But it's, uh, an immers it's kind of an immersive documentary style program where, for better or worse, the correspondent or the reporter, in this case myself, uh, becomes a character in the story. So uh, some people like that, some people don't. But I hope we have time. I'm going to be brief because I hope we have time to have a Q&A uh, to make this a more interactive panel. Absolutely. And young man, this is Kareem, who's the founder of Nameless, raised a million dollars in December. Uh, and he's doing some very interesting stuff, if you'd let us. Tell Hi everyone, well. Kareem Ahmed, or Kareem Rama, I don't know if this thing's on, is this on? All right, great. Um, so I'm the CEO and founder of Nameless, which is a co-viewing platform where people can watch videos and chat, interact with each other in real time, at the same time, around the world. Um, prior to founding that company, I worked at the New York Times, where I headed up growth strategy on video. So we launched Time video, Times Video, uh, the viewing platform for the New York Times. Took that from uh, 10 million video views to 50 million video views in under a year. And then uh, before that, I was also working at Vice, where I was the head of growth and marketing on Vice.com and the YouTube channels, where we helped build it from zero subscribers to 10 million. Uh, wow. And now Vice has kind of taken over. So, so, that, so what Nameless does then is it kind of crawls and trawls all the video content and then separates it into separate silos on TV internet channels. Is, yep. is that about right? So we find, we, we, we find the best videos in different categories, whether it's drones or snowboarding or music videos, um, very niche subjects like anime or ASMR. And we, we take these videos, we turn them into channels. Um, so instead of searching through millions and millions of videos, you go to the channel and you know that these are the 10 best videos in that specific category. And then you're not just left watching the video alone, which is how a lot of us experience video these days, but you're actually interacting with a bunch of other people that have the same passion as you do about that topic. And how many people have you, how many users have you managed to obtain in the last three months? So, so we've just launched our beta uh, less than a month ago, or, or just about a month ago, and we've had over 50,000 users to the site. Um, interaction is, is very high. We've had over 4,000 chat messages sent um, in, in the chat boxes. And the time on site is actually much higher than, than the average video viewing site. So our time on site is, is five minutes on our best channel, five minutes and 40 seconds or so. Um, and our average uh, performing channel is about three and a half minutes. It reminds me of a, a, a games chat network that's pretty big in MENA, Pal Ringo. I think they did that with games, bought a couple of games companies and then had I mean, they're 250,000. Right. OK. So, so what about the scale of this type of business? How quickly is it going to grow? How far do you see it going over the next 12 months? So I, I see uh, Nameless being kind of like the, the ultimate equalizer when it comes to independent media and places where independent media is not readily available. Um, right now, we're working on this technology that, that only we can access, the CMS, which is called Curator, which only the Nameless team can access. But as soon as we open that up to the public, and you can create a channel about apples, and you can create a channel about skateboarding, and you can create a channel about uh, Depka dancing, then we're, we're talking about massive scale, because it turns into ultimately the video equivalent of Reddit. Um, so you have subreddits that are focused specifically on video that anyone in the world can create. We were talking earlier, young man, about vertical video. 
and I showed my utter ignorance by not knowing what that meant, thinking it was something from up there. But it's just basically turning the camera around. And, th and that's based a lot on the way that people use ch Snapchat. Would that be right? Yeah, I mean, as many of you may know, Snapchat has just over 100 million users, which if you compare it to the however many billion Facebook has, um, it sounds very small. But again, it's that coveted millennial demographic. And they're very addicted to using it, not just for personal reasons, but increasingly you're starting to see media companies uh, recognize that for as much as you know, a video may look better when it's horizontal, and that's what we're all accustomed to, uh, these days, for example, that gentleman over there was just maybe taking a picture, but his ho he was holding his phone vertically. And I think Snapchat and you know, these kinds of uh, new kind of emerging uh, platforms are really revolutionizing not just the way in which people communicate with each other as consumers, but it's starting very quickly to influence how producers create content. Um, how many of you actually use Snapchat on a daily basis? Yeah, see, it's, it's not that many. And, and quite frankly, like, you know, I, I should be you know, truthful and say I don't use it as often as perhaps I should. But one statistic that I want to like, leave you with is that there are 7 billion uh, video views on Snapchat every single day. And if you think of that uh, in terms of scaling up, there's a lot of opportunity in terms of how you can change how you tell stories. Of course, uh, it's very short in terms of the content. Um, but I think what's really fascinating is even though I work for you know, a very cinematographic uh, company like HBO, which creates like, you know, long form immersive uh, storytelling, I think what's really exciting is that you see unconventional ways to do things in the business, such as telling vertical videos. I mean, it sounds more complicated than it may be, but all it is is that the news business, and this is, I think, the most exciting thing about what's happening right now in the news business, is starting to take its cues not just from how users consume content on various platforms, but also how they produce content on their own. And we've seen companies uh, focus on interactivity and audience engagement just for the sake of it. But now I think you're starting to see an actual deliberate attempt to mimic the behavior of consumers on the behalf of producers, which to me is very exciting. And those, and those 7 billion views, how long do they last? What's the average? How long do those videos last for? How many seconds? I mean, uh, you know, they're very short because they disappear, but you can, yeah, but you can screenshot them and whatnot. And yeah, that, yeah. again, I think speaks to like, there's not just uh, vertical video, there's also 360 video, virtual reality. And all of this, I think, leads uh, to one conclusion, which is, again, the one that I think that's most compelling, which is there is no longer an autonomy, there's no longer an authoritative voice in the media. You know, producers, back a few years ago started to increasingly recognize that consumers were also producing videos. Um, and I think for as much as it may mean that my job may soon become obsolete because I'm a you know, correspondent who's like in the actual video, uh, people who want to consume content, especially diehard news junkies, want to feel as though they're as close to the action as possible. And so that's why yeah. you know, these emerging technologies like 360 video where you put on a VR set and rather than sit back and passively consume content through video, you're able to interact and, and you yep. know, kind of dictate what you're actually seeing, whether it's you know, a chaotic prote protest scene or a really emotional uh, kind of uh, scene that people yep. really re resonate with because they're in it. I, I was um, the MC for the, um, the VR section of South by Southwest um, last month, and I looked at 16 companies and we, you know, voted six through, and there was one company called Splash that called it, it described itself as the Snapchat of VR. So we've moved on from the Uber of something to the Snapchat of something, do you know what I mean? Um, so, so what I saw in the space of that afternoon was some pretty awesome stuff and some pretty weird stuff. Where do you see VR fitting in in the future? Or how will it fit in with your channels? Or will it have a separate channel or will it be an overarching channel? Right. So I, I, I think that there have been so many start and stops with VR that a lot of people were skeptical maybe a year or two ago. Um, VR has been around for a very long time, but I think at this point in time, there's so much money, so much investment, so much effort and creative energy that's going into VR that I think this actually is finally the moment that it happens. Um, you know, I was working at the New York Times and we were talking about let's do this VR thing before any other media company does it. And I was so you know, enthused to hear <coughs> this major, major media company, someone that struggled to keep up, someone that was late on mobile and was late on tablet and was late on apps, say, we got to be first on VR. And 
actually putting the money and the resources and doing a partnership. I don't know if you guys know, but, but the New York Times did a partnership with Google where they sent out a million Google Cardboards um, to every single newspaper subscriber in the United States, um, which I think is in insane. All of a sudden you have yeah. every household that subscribes to the New York Times has a Google Cardboard, which if you don't know what that is, it enables you to put your smartphone in it and then all of a sudden experience VR just like you would on a, you know, a $2,000 or however much it costs Oculus Rift machine. So I, I think that, that definitely this is, this is uh, it might not be the exact moment where like we're sitting in this entire room and we're all wearing VR, but I think it's most certainly the moment where, where it's kind of like the beginning of VR's rise. And I don't think uh, that it will go away in the next couple of years. I think it's around to stay. And I think that we should kind of prepare, whether we're in the news business or the entertainment business or the music business, or even just the experience business like this conference, to prepare for that VR moment um, in the future. Saying that, I showed my 13-year-old son uh, Google Cardboard and he said it was a piece of shit. He told <laughs> me to go away. So who knows? You know what I mean? He's, he's VR old. in your world. Say it again. What about VR in your world? You know, I think the most interesting thing for you know, VR is that uh, character-driven stories, I think, tend to resonate with audiences the most. And obviously, we live in a time when half of you, I can tell, well, not half of you, but enough of you are already checking your phones. Maybe you're on Twitter. And you know, attention spans are increasingly becoming shorter and shorter. And I think the nice thing about VR, and I think what's promising and really exciting, um, and we've seen many media companies, Vice included, you know, experiment with this, is you know, now what used to be a three second shot on TV that you would see traditionally in TV news, you know, you go three seconds, five seconds, maybe 10 seconds as mo at most, uh, and a very linear style of storytelling is quickly being challenged by this notion of VR where, you know, if you have a VR set on, you're not gonna wanna see things just in three minutes. So first of all, scenes have to be kind of drawn out, maybe 20 seconds or 30 seconds. And because you have a VR set on and you're actually engaged in the actual scene, and so immersed in the story, uh, at least conceptually, and obviously this is very experimental, it doesn't allow you to be on your phone and to be on your tablet while you, while, as you may be if you were watching CNN, uh, for those of you who watch CNN. Um, but in, in all seriousness, you know, I would be lying if I presumed that I knew whether or not it was gonna stick around, whether or not it's gonna become the norm. But if you look at trends in like the gaming industry, uh, I think it's revolutionized the gaming industry and you're starting to see uh, not just media companies, but uh, even advertisers, you know, try and mimic that kind of immersive experience. Because at the end of the day, the biggest trend I think that we can all agree on, hopefully, that's emerged in the last five years in the media business is that this notion of consuming video in a passive way um, is kind of uh, boring. So, and so what you're saying then, that the video has accelerated up to this point. Now with VR, it's coming to a stop and it's reversing back the other way to create longer stories, more time for creators, yeah, exactly. more, more integration. And, and you know, with VR, one thing is like the reporter can be a distraction. So a lot of media companies that traditionally relied on reporters and reporters and journalists were traditionally uh, what made news uh, authoritative and, and, you know, kind of the authority or convincing or trustworthy. Uh, increasingly, consumers are skeptical, I, I think, uh, at this notion that authority is what actually makes a piece of content great. Increasingly, you're starting to see, um, for example, with the advent of AJ+, Plus, for those of you who are familiar with it, what makes it so compelling is that they're able to provide context in two minutes, and what makes it so trustworthy is that it's accessible. You know, the person who's presenting the news for what they're worth um, is speaking in a very candid, casual manner. Uh, and the one last thing I'll just say that I think is really interesting about VR is for, again, it may very well make my, my, my job obsolete, but um, people no longer want to trust that media companies are experimenting for the sake of profit, which may very well be the case, but I think why so many media companies are experimenting with VR is because they're recognizing that um, audiences like yourselves want to be immersed completely in the story and have the liberty to choose, you know, what to consume. Uh, and gone are the days, for, and I think this is a great thing, where media companies just want to be on the cutting edge for the sake of it. I've worked at many companies, including HuffPost, uh, and even at Al Jazeera and the New York Times, where, 
you know, they hear, oh, everyone wants to engage their audience and everyone wants to do live. So let's just go live for 30 minutes and let's, you know, put a Twitter thing so people can interact while they're watching content without necessarily looking at how uh, audiences behave and consume content. And I think that's why AJ Plus has been so successful because they create content that is specific not just to the platform that they're producing the content for, which may be Facebook or Twitter, but also for their demographics. Um, and more and more we're seeing millennials consume content on and these platforms. And we're seeing this, this is totally a mobile thing. It's totally mobile, even for what you're trying to do with your, yeah. with your new, new product. It's totally mobile. I, I'd, I'd, say, I'd say it's, it's overwhelmingly uh, mobile, especially in, um, in emerging markets. Uh, actually, anywhere outside the United States, to be honest with you, it's, yeah. it's, it's overwhelmingly mobile. Um, you know, that's not to, that, 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 pro that poses an interesting kind of challenge, though, uh, which ties into this AJ+, Plus, this n now this news, this, you go on Facebook, and, it, and it, it seems like the content all kind of is one size fits all now because the formula has been figured out. Get, get beautiful videos, get beautiful images, put text over them, describe the story, you can watch it when it's muted and you don't even have to press the play button. I think this passive kind of experience that's flooded Facebook reminds me of um, the early days of YouTube when it was a, a massive gold rush to YouTube. It's like, wow, I know exactly how to make YouTube content. They want like a, a vlogger personality, a makeup tutorial, any sort of tutorial will do well on YouTube. And I think that we're in the same kind of gold rush with Facebook where people are realizing, wow, this is a massive, massive pipe that needs to be filled and the easiest way to make that content, instead of pointing a camera at myself, is to take images and put pictures on it. But I think what happens then is that, like, like consumers or audiences always do, is they want the next thing. And I think that's why new formats like VR, new formats like the company that we're trying to create, make engagement the priority, make interaction the priority, and it's less about watching a 30 second video and more about sitting down, watching with intention, watching with a purpose, having a conversation, or just getting away from the rest of the internet and putting a mask on. Do you, do you think then that the video medium needed to be refreshed? I, I think it needs a refresh right now. You do? I, okay. I, I, think that, I think that you can only take so many videos that look exactly the same before you need to get something new. Um, and I think that you, you can also see it on Facebook right now, the videos that tend to tend to go the most viral, tend to get the most viewership, are not videos that are produced by media companies. They're videos that are produced by people. And I think that that, that that small tidbit of information can go a long way in guiding the content that you are either creating or curating. OK. Um, there seems to be like a, a pretty big audience here. Uh, and maybe we can go a bit interactive. And I'd really like to thank you too. The last session I did at South by Southwest for an hour with this guy, he was a lovely guy. It was like pulling teeth, and this is just so easy. Fantastic, thank you. So anyone who's got a question, please raise your hand, uh, and we'll get you talking. Lady at the front, if you could introduce yourself, madam. Someone got a... Does anyone have Someone a mic? Someone got a mic? C come, and tell, come up here and tell us your question. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I have a question for both in terms of any example that you want to share where a brand has been able to use what you guys are talking about. <laughs> Hi, I'm a journalist. My name is Noor from the Arabian Marketer. The question is any example that either Hamad or Kareem can share in terms of how brands have been able to use VR or new forms of video well. Any of your favorites? I saw um, a new moderator, thank you. Did everyone hear that question? So uh, examples of brands using these new formats or, or new technology as well. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna go like right back to the New York Times again. Um, I think that their T-Brand content studio has done a phenomenal job of integrating brands into video content. So they've done an incredible series uh, uh, with Netflix um, that profiles and documents women in prison. Um, and they go out and, and what they did was like this is the question they asked. How would a journalist approach this specific thing? Um, and this was to promote Orange is the New Black. They said, how would a journalist approach this thing? And then that's exactly what they did. They sent a journalist to prison. They interviewed the female prisoners. They made videos with the female prisoners. And then they aired them. They shot it, made it beautiful, and they aired them. Um, so T-Brand Studio, I think, is, is bar none, I, I'd say, the highest um, form of branded video content that there is. And then also um, T-Brand Studio 
same company, the New York Times, has been working on a lot of VR initiatives with different brands. Um, I actually don't know what the brands are, so maybe that's a bad example, but I know that, that they've done some great films with companies. Comment? Add to that? Yeah, the only thing I'll say very quickly to add to that is uh, beyond the New York Times, which I completely agree with, is Vice, obviously, and I'm not saying that just because I work with them. I mean, Vice for a long time, and as you would know, you were there for a while, has been on the cutting edge of uh, immersive kind of storytelling, not just on YouTube through Vice News, and Vice News has been experimenting a lot with VR, but also, you know, again, this concept of what interactivity actually means. It used to mean in the past that the consumer would be able to communicate with the person presenting the news in real time or with other people. But what Vice has done, uh, I think, is that they've, you know, for example, in certain protests in the US, they've experimented with the notion of 360 video. And the, the reason I, I kind of praise Vice for their experimentation is because, you know, whenever there's a new technology that emerges, there's always problems. Like, how many of you go to a party? I know this may seem like a non sequitur, but how many of you go to a party? You see a million people, maybe you've had a few drinks, or if we're in Dubai, mint lemonades, and then you decide that, which is a whole fallacy, because I don't know, I grew up here and people don't really drink it, but I guess it's a tourist thing. But side note, uh, you know, and then you ghost. Do you know the concept of ghosting? You kind of leave the party without saying bye to people. So there's also this term when it comes to uh, VR, which is ghosting, and it's one of the kind of glitches that you have where like all of a sudden you're in the VR world and you're immersed and you're looking around and a character that was there who might be a central character ghosts and just disappears for a second and then returns. Uh, and I, the reason I, I, I say this is even though these things happen, Vice has been publishing these things online because the only way to actually, I think, become experts in terms of creating this kind of content is to be willing to make the mistakes and have the audience kind of tell them uh, and give them some feedback as to what's not working. And that was one thing that I noticed with Vice was the issue. Uh, so it sounds to me suspiciously like mobile used to be. <laughs> I remember um, I was a judge um, and remember that film, that show, 24. So they were trying to do 24 on mobile uh, and they thought it would be really clever and change the actors just for the mobile screen. So there's going to be mistakes all along everywhere you look, I think. Are you sure that this is the year of VR? Oh, I didn't say it was the year of VR, I said it was the moment. This is the, the stop, start, stop, start, and I think we're started. And how long it takes for it to get into every single household, I have no idea. How long until uh, every media company is producing it, I don't know. I think that this is the moment that it begins, though. Right, okay. Just mostly because of the money. I think when you have money pouring into an industry, that's a very good sign that that industry, uh, it, it, could go, it, could, it could go waywire, you know? Uh, we saw it with 3D printing. That was like the big, big thing. Money was pouring into 3D printing. And ultimately, it was the consumer who didn't adopt the technology. They thought MakerBot's too expensive, this 3D printing system is too expensive. They didn't buy it. If that happens with VR, then uh, of course it's, it's not gonna start. But right now, the runway is there, the money is there, the investment is there, and the creative energy is there to make it happen if the consumer wants it. Well, okay. one just quick thing I wanted to say, like, uh, you know, no one knows how quickly VR is going to scale up. Uh, because as, how many of you have actually used a VR set? Oh, wow. Impressive. More people than actually uh, use Snapchat. Well, what's interesting is, you know, when you have a VR set on, there's a limit to how long you can have it on. I think it's like an average of 10 minutes because it, it can become a bit, you, you think less than 10 minutes. Yeah, so 10 minutes is maybe the maximum. And you know, when you have a VR set on, there's also, for as much as, you know, especially millennials want to feel something burning, <laughs> is a special effect. Uh, speaking of special effects, um, you know, when you have a VR set on, what actually happens is sometimes a character will come so close to you in the action that it can actually feel very claustrophobic. Uh, and people who aren't accustomed with being in, you know, tear gas, as we are right now, <laughs> um, can feel as though that's very overwhelming. And so for as much as you know, it immerses you in a way, and that's a good thing generally in the business, it can also be a bad thing. So I think everyone's you know, experimenting. And, and you know, in media, that's the most exciting thing. And when you say the money's flying in, the money's flying in from advertisers or from investors or from the ecosystem? It's from all parties. I mean, the money's flying yeah. in from Facebook as an acquisition to Oculus Rift. The money's flying in from advertisers who want to make VR branded content. The money's flying in from media companies who want to produce the content. And then there's people that are willing to make it. You know, there's new companies popping up in LA, San Francisco, New York, probably Berlin, Dubai. VR specialists. Um, and, and I don't know. I, I was skeptical a year ago, but I think now I'm like, okay, I get it. Like, I think that this yeah. could actually be the time. 
And you think that maybe LA might be one of those places that might be the hub? I, th I think LA has a lot of, uh, of potential right now. I think it's the Hollywood capital of the world. It would make a lot of sense for the entertainment VR to come out of LA. Yeah. Um, I think New York, obviously the media capital of the world, and that's where a lot of the media companies are doing this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And one thing I just want to say quickly, I'm not a businessman by any means, um, but it is relatively inexpensive to produce 360 videos. I think, you know, based on the technology you use, it can cost less than $15,000. Uh, I mean, you, you could do it DIY. You could get a bunch of GoPros and strap them together. There's ways to do it. Yeah. Exactly. And like, uh, I'm not necessarily technically uh, an expert on any of that, but just from a consumer side, I mean, I think that's what's super exciting, you know, giving, and it's again this notion that we've heard time and time again, the first time I came to the uh, Abu Dhabi Media Summit just in Abu Dhabi a few years ago, one thing we were all talking about is how, for better or worse, the Arab uprisings that we witnessed a few years ago really allowed, you know, again, this notion of consumers to be producers. So because the technology is relatively inexpensive, uh, even though LA and New York are kind of traditionally, yeah. conventionally where this would happen, I think it allows people anywhere, including here, uh, to experiment with this. And yeah, that to okay. me is very promising. Okay. Um, has anyone got the courage to come up and ask a question? I've got a very loud voice. We've got a couple of minutes. Please, this gentleman there. After you, you come after, sir. This gentleman. Do you want to do the? You gonna do the mic thing? Ahmed, do you want to do the? Oh. Hey, just how's, introduce how's yourself, sir. Oh, uh, my name is Azrael. I'm a producer for the Soundgarden. I was just wondering, like, I'm really excited about the whole uh, VR technology and how it's come up, but. I almost feel like we've skipped over augmented reality, and I was wondering whether there's going to be a time where that comes back, or virtual reality is just going to be the more immersive experience, and we're going to forget about augmented stuff. Did you understand uh, that? No, no. Say Did it, you, could, what, he's wondering about augmented reality as compared with virtual reality. Is there, is there, is there going to be a jump between the two, or what do you think? What's the, the linearism of it? I, I personally don't have a ton of thought on it. Um, I, th I think they might like go in parallel, and where virtual reality becomes the main kind of thing that people are into, I think there will be like a niche of people who are using augmented reality in, in, in interesting ways. But I think augmented reality might be like the QR code of this video stuff. Yeah. Like it's kind of like a little weird hanging cousin yeah, that, that some people are interested in, but I don't think it's going to be captivating people like VR does. And the, I I'm not an expert per se on that either, but the one thing I'll say is, you know, unlike the gaming industry, which obviously uses augmented reality a lot and relies on it, obviously with journalism, even in today's day and age, you need to be very uh, aware of having credibility in the sense of um, not recreating events. And I think with the advent of 360 or even augmented reality, that can be a danger. Um, uh, I'll just stop talking because I don't know much about this and you have a question. Is that my gun? Hey, hey, okay. Just uh, introduce I'm yourself. Bogdan. Introduce yourself, sir. I'm Bogdan. I'm film a filmmaker, and I've been exploring this 360 uh, video for a while now. What do you think about 360 video, but live streamed, like live streaming of 360 video in real time? Um, I'm kind of uh, searching and merging with the subject, so. I'll, I'll say something about that if you two don't mind. Yeah. Is that Amnesty International sent me uh, a 360 um, of the bombing of Aleppo in Syria, uh, and that's one of the most extraordinary things I've seen within that type of. Um, I don't. I don't know if you are aware, but uh, actually, some com a company did a live 360 uh, live stream from the Oscars this year. Cool. From the Oscars, yeah. Uh, I, I think it's really cool. I would, I would be interested in, in seeing more of it. I, I think Bernie Sanders uh, did a, a live streamed one of his um, debates or his talks, and, and it was really cool. 360 video live stream. It was, it was awesome. The one thing I'll say is uh, I think obviously there are many uses for live streaming, and 360 affords a lot for it. But um, I would suggest, for your sake, just in the spirit of time, uh, Dina Takuri is sitting in front of you, and she works for AJ+. Plus. Many of you may know her. And 
they experiment a lot with live streaming, and, and I know that they're working on that, so maybe you can ask her that afterwards when we're done. Cool, thanks. Um, I'm afraid we're out of time. Um, so I'd like to thank my two panelists for a fantastic discussion. Hopefully you can catch them later. Thanks. Bravo. Bye.